Zach, how are things? Good, good. Thanks for having me on. No, great to have you here. I've been a, a long time admirer slash, I don't even know what the word is. You you make me very confused. <laughs> I don't really understand. I don't really not in a not in a suggestive sort of way, but in a, I I don't understand how the man moves so quickly sort of way. And I'll already have given the context in the intro, but you are just just remind people how quickly you run a hundred miles again. So the fastest I've done it is uh, six minute forty seven second uh, per mile pace um, for a hundred miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just wanted to hear it from your mouth because I've seen it on paper so many times, but it, it just blows my mind. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get to we'll get to that, but I think the the question I really want to start with because the, the the journey fascinates me is what drew you to your first ultra marathon in 2010. Yeah, you know, it was almost by accident to some degree. I was aware of ultra marathons. Uh, I had uh, I had read. I had read a couple books actually, I think at that point where they were just kind of highlighting the sport and it just felt like this, uh, this sort of like far out, almost like expansion of the act of running. And, you know, I was pretty young at the time. I think I was 24. So my thought with ultra marathons were, this is interesting enough where I think I'll probably do one, but I thought, well, I'll exhaust myself at like more Olympic distance stuff until like I'm in my early thirties and then maybe I'll try out some ultra marathons, but I wasn't aware enough to know that there were ultra marathons in the state of Wisconsin where I was living at the time. So I was always just kind of looking at just some race options for the year. I came across this 50 miler that happened to be like about like an hour and a half from where I was living. And I was just like, you know what, maybe I'll just try that one and see what it's like. And my thought process with that was get the experience, go back, do Olympic distance stuff, and then kind of resume that trajectory of maybe getting into ultra marathons later in life. And I did it and enjoyed the whole process of training for it a lot more than I expected to. The race itself had had pretty much everything I think one would maybe imagine a, an ultra marathon would, where you have your highs, your lows, your positives, your negatives, and then you ultimately cross the finish line. And I think like reflecting back on everything that happened over the course of 50 miles just lends itself to making it kind of feel like you condensed a really long journey into a short period of time. And there's just a lot of takeaways with those type of experiences. And that kind of got me hooked to the degree where, uh, I did wait a whole nother year to do another one, but then that following year I did that same event and then sort of parlayed that into two more 50 milers within a couple months. And then I was hooked by 2012, I was all in on ultra marathons and had more or less kind of put Olympic distance stuff on the, on the back burner as, um, as fun things to still do and incorporate into my training, but not necessarily be target races and started focusing on, uh, at that point in time, it was basically 50 Ks to hundred Ks. Although I did end up doing my first hundred mile in 2012, also earlier than expected because I raced into it and was told I'd be an idiot not to do it. So I did it not wanting to be an idiot. It's just a, a hundred mile on a whim yeah. is something I think a lot of people could aspire to be able to do, but your, your background was in track and field and cross country, wasn't it? Yeah. So how from a discipline, I guess lessons learned or, or value gained from a personal point of view, do ultramarathons compare to that? Because I mean, I, last year I worked myself back down to a sub five minute mile and I'm three weeks out from a 250 kilometer single stage event. And that's all within the sort of I think it'll be pretty much bang on six months apart, maybe six and a half months apart, in fact. Mm -hmm. And the demand and discipline and personal lessons and value that I've gained from the training demand and the way you need to approach those different things is vastly different, vastly different. And I think that's what makes me love varied disciplines, varied sports, varied distances. Mm -hmm. So for you, did did you did you miss any of the harder effort, harder intensity stuff for track and field, cross country, or did you just feel this is where I belong, running very long distances and and ultimately doing hundred milers on a whim? Yeah, you know it's a great question. I would say like at first, my thought was like, awesome, I can avoid speed work because <laughs> <laughs> after college, I would say my trajectory into running was a little bit. Uh, I, I would say I learned slow in the sense that I was kind of, I felt like early on, I was kind of always catching up to a degree where I got interested in running a little bit later in terms of taking it real seriously in high school compared to like most kids who are going to take it seriously and go on to do it in college. Uh, so then when I got to college 
it was kind of an eye opener to me in terms of just like what kind of numbers some of my peers were hitting from like a training standpoint. Uh, the the workouts were just the workouts mapped similar in terms of their structure, but they were just a lot more aggressive. So like my college experience was a lot of like, OK, I know I love this sport now. I want this to be part of my life. At that point, I was considering it to be probably a hobby versus a profession, um, but I was still kind of figuring out just where my body's limits were, what workouts responded and just kind of learning more detail about the sport or rather than just kind of, I had a great cross country and track coach by, by my senior year in high school, but I wasn't probably in a place where I was able to really leverage his expertise to the degree I did with my college coach. So, uh, that experience kind of led me to kind of some things where I just knew just intuitively, like I kind of liked the long distance stuff. The long run was my favorite workout. So after that, it was kind of just like, oh, cool, here's this sport that um, I can sort of lean into that. And I think I learned probably after being out of college for for a bit that the speed work component still plays an important role if you're going to try to run a fast 100 miler. It just tends to be like an order of operations thing as much as anything. So like if I'm peaking for a 5K or a mile or something like that, then some of the short intervals, the stuff that's closer to like your VO2 max um, for listeners who aren't quite into the endurance stuff. I mean, essentially your VO2 max, the more important thing there is going to be the pace that you can move at that intensity. And that's going to map to about a 12 minute all out effort for a lot of people. So those type, you building workouts around that intensity is greatly different than building workouts around the intensity you're going to do for say a hundred miles. But I still do them because I still think they're beneficial in making me a better hundred miler. I'm just going to do them much earlier in the training plan and probably not nearly as, as, as many as I would maybe do. So like for a 5k, I'm probably doing a lot of those leading into the goal race. Whereas for a hundred miler, so assuming I've got a strong foundation, I'm going to go through a speed work development phase and include some short intervals around that intensity quite early in the plan. And then eventually pivot towards focusing most of my training load on lower intensity stuff, long run development, and that sort of stuff later in the plan as I get closer to the race itself. So, um, I still get to dip my toe in that stuff. And if I'm really, really, uh, dialed in i can hop in some 5ks and 10ks and you know that sort of distance around the time i'm doing those speeder development stuff and still kind of uh get a little bit of taste of that world uh but yeah i think i think the further i get away from speed work when i do kind of step away from it or like early in my ultra career where i kind of abandon it for a while altogether uh, i do start to kind of miss that input so the thing i like about it is you sort of have this cycle of variety where if you really kind of uh, reach the logical conclusion in your development in a single training block with one type of input uh, or, or yeah, they have one type of input, then you kind of move to the next thing or the next piece of the puzzle. So you, there's always something new kind of coming up. You don't have to necessarily be staring down the exact same thing over and over again all the time. How did you adapt to the mindset demand of ultras versus your, your, your background? Because I think, I think that's where most people are fascinated with them. And, and for me, uh, it took me a long time to develop the tolerance to be able to kind of just be quite stoical and matter of fact about just taking these things on and going through the ebbs and flows. But it does seem like you just took it in your stride. You, you did number one, 50 miler, loved it. And then before you know it, it's just what you do. Was there inertia to break through or was there a specific childhood experience that, that graced you with this ability to just get your head down and, and go through it? Was it that coach? in a college setting, what was it that allowed you to just enter this world and move forwards? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I would say like the biggest difference I noticed between like the competition side of ultra marathon and some of the shorter distance Olympic distance stuff is just like when you're racing something short, it is intense enough where you sort of kind of automatically have this tunnel vision where you just act and you don't really worry about what you did until afterwards, then you maybe assess kind of how things went, where your mistakes were, where the right moves were, and you sort of unpack it after the fact, at least I did. With 100 milers and 50 milers and things long enough, it's low enough intensity where like you make a decision to do something, you've got plenty of time and mental bandwidth to really think about that and obsess over it potentially. So your mind shift kind of has to go towards more kind of steering the direction you want your mind to go versus just acting impulsively. 
uh, based on just like your intuition from from training and what you know ahead of time to be the right move with things that are a little shorter and a little higher in the intensity spectrum. And that ha- it, it kind of has its positives and negatives. It's like for one, it's like it's never that painful it's sort of just like this like low level discomfort that just doesn't go away so in the long stuff it's like you get to a point where it doesn't really get worse physically from my experience it just doesn't get any better so let's say you hit that point around mile 30 of 100 mile you're not like feeling miserable but you know you're going to be dealing with relative discomfort for the next 70 miles and then it becomes a battle of how do you nutritionally hydration and mentally kind of keep things moving at that same pace, same intensity for that long period of time. And a lot of that is basically what I like to call like this process of zooming in and zooming out. So if I'm getting to a point where I'm 30 miles into a hundred mile and I'm thinking about finishing, I need to zoom in because that's just too much to wrap my head around. I'm going to get myself kind of, uh, in a position where I'm burning more mental energy than I need to be. And I need to bring that goal down to something like, well, what's the next step in this process? What do I need to do in order to just get to the next stage of this race? So I can kind of take it one chunk at a time and present it in my mind in a way that is, that is uh, digestible. Then there's also the zooming out component of it, which is how do I take this process that inevitably is going to at times present you with the magnitude of it, and make it look smaller so my mind doesn't get overwhelmed by it. And then I'll zoom out to like the entirety of things where let's say I decided six months ahead of time to do a hundred mile race. From the day I decide that every training input I do between then and the start of that race is going to be massive in combination relative to the event itself. So if I'm 30 miles into a hundred miler and starting to kind of creep towards there's this 70 miles left. How am I ever going to do it? I can zoom out and think, well, I'm really most of the way there when I look at this plan as a whole and kind of not separating the event from the process itself is key to that. Because if you separate the event, then you can hyper focus on its magnitude versus how small it is actually relative to everything you've done to prepare for it. What's the biggest hole you've found yourself in from a memory point of view? Is there a moment that really sticks with you where you thought, wow, that that took a lot from me to get out of that and keep moving forwards. Because I've certainly, I mean, I'm not even going to pretend to put myself in the same class as you in terms of pace when it comes to ultras, but I found myself in many holes over the years <laughs> that stick with me. And that was a much slower <laughs> pace. Yeah. So to be able to keep moving forwards <laughs> at a relatively slow pace, but for you to keep moving forwards at 6.47 or there or thereabouts, are there any that have really stuck with you on record campaigns, on races that meant a lot to you? Mm-hmm. Anything keep you up at night? Yeah. I mean, I think the ones that keep you up at night are probably the ones where you where it didn't go well or as well as maybe it could have been. Uh, the ones that you navigate well are, I think, ones you maybe look back a little more fondly on. But uh, the one, I have one that sticks out to me because it was uh, just because of just like the whole circumstance. I had just like a real beautiful buildup to this race. I hit some like historic peaks in terms of my training and i had some numbers that were very specific to the event itself it was on a 400 meter track so i had done i was living in northern california at the time and i was close enough to uc davis's track so i do like a two mile run to the track hop on the track for like 90 minutes to two hours most weekdays and just circles and circles and circles and circles and i was just hitting paces at an effort uh, for pretty long duration that were really promising. And a lot of those runs I had done in kind of more of a progressive nature where I was kind of like speeding up near the end. And to me, I think there's, I mean, there's a physical and then there's the mental side of preparing, um, the physical side of progression runs, I think can leave a lot to be desired if they're not implemented properly. But the mental side of just knowing as your legs get more tired, you can actually speed up versus hold on for dear life can be a powerful tool to prepare you for what you actually want to do on race day. So I showed up to the a race in 2015, about as fit as I had been for a hundred mile at the time with my mindset on the uh, world record for hundred miles at the time, which was, I think 1128 then 2803, I believe, and went out on world record pace was on world record pace through 80 miles. And I remember thinking, or I, I, yeah, I remember running the math in my head when I got to 80 miles and it was like, if you can average a seven minute mile pace for the last 20 miles, you'll break the world record. 
the world record pace at the time was like 653 i think so it was like i didn't even have to go i had already banked enough time where i could actually go slower than world record pace for the last 20 and i just couldn't do it i just i slowed down it was like 730s were like all i could muster up and i was working like about as hard as i ever have in a race to even sustain that i sometimes look back at that and i think like Man, I'm surprised I didn't blow up worse to the degree where I was running like eight, nine minute mile, maybe 10 minute mile pace, but I did keep it together long enough. But it was that race was so exhausting to me by the end. Um, I went on to break the American record and ran 11 hours and 40 minutes. But the reason that one stands out to me is because like you have this added incentive if you're running 100 miles under 12 hours to keep going till 12 hours because there's a 12 hour timed event as well. And the first time I ran a track 100 miler and ran 11 hours and 47 minutes, broke the American record there. I stayed out for, I think it was another 1.7 miles or somewhere around there to get to the 12 hour distance. This time I just stopped. <laughs> I had 20 minutes left. I could have kept going around and <laughs> potentially gone further than I had that time prior. Um, I mean, on paper, I was seven minutes ahead of where I was that time before. So in, you know, you would imagine I would go a little bit further, but no, I just completely stopped and was like, didn't care about that last 20 minutes. I was done. I was trying to get to a hundred miles with, with any, any bit of energy I had. So, um, that one stands out to me as like one where I just think I just didn't know quite enough about the pacing strategies that are going to likely yield the best results for these type of events and just overreached a little bit early on. Obviously you don't notice it that easily in the beginning. And that's one of the hardest thing about hundred miles is, um, too fast can still feel pretty easy. And you can almost get yourself into a situation where the more fit you are, the more you can mask that because mm. then, you know, a faster pace than what you can tolerate for 100 miles may actually feel even easier yet. And I just kind of found myself in that spot where I probably leaned a little bit too much on just like how good I was feeling in the moment and a couple of occasions ran a few miles a little faster than I should have. And then I found myself up paying, found, found myself paying for that a little bit in the last 20% of that race. So that's when I always kind of looked back on like, you know, had I just strategized and executed a little bit better, I think I probably would have broke the world record on that day. Um, but you know, it was also one of those things where at that point in time I was like, well, cool, I'll just go do it next time, <laughs> next year or half a year or whatever. And it ended up taking me another, I think, almost four years to get to the point where I actually executed the way I wanted to and actually did break the world record uh, at the time for, for that distance. And just for context, that world record, the time still stands as the American record, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. But it's, um, oh, I've blanked on his name. The um, Alexander Eastern Sorokin, European. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he has the world record now. What What's the time difference between the two of you on that? His world record, I think, is like 20, I think it's like 28 minutes, about 28 minutes faster than mine. Okay, okay. So again, in a disgustingly different league of speed that I can't even comprehend, <laughs> but it's just, I, 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 the, this, the, you mentioned pacing strategy being one of the main learning lessons from that not going to plan. It, it seems like a strange thing, but the pacing strategy of 100 miles as a sentence seems logical, but when that's sub seven minute mile pace my brain starts to melt a little bit <laughs> so talk us through if you were if you were going for a best effort 100 mile let's say you had six months of prep and you were you were planning your six months out now you, as you've already said you'd have a lot of your harder effort interval stuff early on you'd probably focus on more tempo so threshold off stuff in blocks in the middle mm -hmm. and then it'd just be pacing specific stuff towards the end and that pacing specific stuff i assume would just be drilling the pace range that you want to be operating in when it came to race day itself but how, how would you manage race day? Do you break it up into chunks where you're going to be working in this range? Do you say, I'm going to start at this pace and hold it for as long as I can and then default to this range? How, how do you break it down? Yeah, it's a great question. And this is probably one of the biggest shifts I've had in my strategy over my career in terms of how I go about like a race like this. So I think or like early on, I think a lot of alternatives still prescribe to this and, you know, who knows? Maybe they're right. We probably don't know enough about. I just tend to think that based on what we know from other endurance sports, this approach probably maps more accurately, which is like the closer you can get to an even split, the better. So like maybe that's a percentage point or two on either side of even that is kind of like a good loading zone or an operating zone that's not going to necessarily like get you into a position where you're giving back more time than you gain because you went out too fast like I did in 2015 or get out too slow and then you find yourself at the end thinking had I gone a little faster early on I would have finished sooner and I just didn't have like 
you know, the, the speed to kind of eat up that margin by the end. I think that's probably like a couple percentage points. So the way I'll usually strategize is I'll pick a time that I'm targeting kind of based on where I think my fitness is at based for comparatively to historical points. And then from that time, I just kind of start reverse engineering kind of the, the pace that would be required. Then I, I try to build it out in a way where there's like an aggressive, a moderate and a conservative pace where the conservative is going to be this is the slowest I can likely go and still feel confident that if things go really well, I'll be able to speed up enough at the end and potentially run a negative split to the degree where I won't be in that situation where I'm thinking, all right, well, I went out too slow and that costed me too much. The aggressive side is going to be like, this is the fastest I can likely produce for this day. Anything faster is probably going to cost me time on the back end if I find myself running faster than this in the early stages of the race. And then the middle is just going to probably be that kind of goal time, that that more like a uh, general target, more or less. Uh, and I'm going to try to be kind of in that zone the whole time. And the way I usually do it on these track events is... I'll look at what that plays out to from like a lap split standpoint. And every time you go around the loop, uh, usually it's 400 meters, but some tracks are different sizes. You'll get to see that that split of how fast you did that loop. So I've got a range usually there. And then I'll spot check that occasionally and just make sure I'm in. What, what is that range? What would, what would it be at that pace? Um, so if it's on a 400 meter track and you look at just like my, um, my 100 mile best, we're looking at uh, would that be it'd be a a minute and forty seconds roughly would be like a good okay. would be a good kind of split. Um, my average pace of six forty seven is probably in terms of moving time is probably closer to six forty because you have I think when I ran that when I ran eleven nineteen with the six forty seven I think I stopped three times for maybe a total of a, two or three minutes and then you are on the track with people doing longer duration things so. You find yourself in lane two, sometimes lane three. So you probably are running closer to, let's say, 101 plus miles at the end of the day. So from a moving pace standpoint, you have to be moving quicker than what the pace actually shows up on paper. Um, But in terms of how that gets reported to me on the race itself, it's going to be specific to the tightest part on the track. So that's the one that's the number I'm measuring. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like a minute 40 is going to get me to a spot that's going to be about a 640 minute mile pace so i'm going to likely be like for that particular day i was kind of building around that because that was around where i was projecting myself to be able to finish for uh, a good day so if you saw a 137 would you inherently pull back a little bit and conversely if you saw a 148 that felt like the same rate of perceived exertion as a 140 should you'd then start to to think ahead and plan ahead as to how you were going to manage the rest of the strategy based on how far you had it how far you had remaining yeah and and yeah that's that's exactly how it works and like the way i look at it is like the easy one to course correct is when you're going too fast because you just slow down Mm. (laughs) when you're going too slow and the effort but the effort feels appropriate or maybe even aggressive you have to ask yourself did i mismanage my goals and if i mismanage my goals is putting myself back within that operating zone going to actually do the thing I'm trying to avoid, which is running slower than I anticipated. So that's always kind of like the bit of uh, uncertainty because we are, you know, I've done these before, so I have some precedent. I've got, I've had really good training buildups and I've been able to map them to a degree where like I can probably expect to be in a specific fitness state where I can rule out a certain pace being too aggressive versus appropriate. And narrow down like how much thought i have to give if i'm actually overshooting or not but at the end of the day you're always a different person when you step on a start line from the time before and you are reaching back to prior experiences so there is that little bit of doubt when you find yourself running slow as to whether you're just in a low patch that you need to get out of or you're overshooting your your potential so from an ego point of view what point if if you knew you're off the mark, if you if you were setting setting out on a track to run 100 miles and you were at mile 21, and between mile 21 and 24, you consistently were seeing 148s, 149s, even though you felt like the effort level was where you'd expect it to be, with that equating to about 140s. At what point would you accept that it's diminishing returns beyond that point, and call it there? 
And at what point would you say, you know what, I think I can push on and this this effort level might level out? Obviously, that comes with experience, which you have an awful lot of. So how do you manage your expectations within the context of, I guess, just one of those days, or as you said, where you've mismanaged your goals, or maybe just something hasn't gone your way the, 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 the last few days ahead of time? Where, where do you Where do you draw the line from a ego point of view in those situations? Yeah, it's a good question. I find that like there's a few different perspectives with this. Um, I mean, there's people in the sport who are like, they'll call them death before DNF, where they're not going to drop out no matter what. So whether they're having a good day or a bad day, they're going to find their way to that finish line, whether they're dragging themselves in or running in uh, you know, at a sprint. So I don't prescribe to that. I think, um, I think there are situations where it's like getting to the finish line is very much the one of the top goals and you should you know, persevere no matter what. But then there's times where like you're better off just saying, hey, today's not my day. I'm going to you know, salvage what's left so that I can get back on the horse sooner and take another crack at it. Um, the track, I think it lends itself. It gets tricky because the track does lend itself to a situation where, hey, maybe I'm not having a great day. Where's the big win on me staying out here on this super controlled, monotonous, boring environment when you know, maybe I can just get back on one again a few months down the road and remedy what went wrong that led me to this. Um, versus say, like if I'm doing the Western States 100, where I don't know that I'll ever get back into that event, you know, so I, t- I tend to look at them sort of like that. The hard part with it is on a track. One thing I'd have noticed is one of the biggest differences between these short loop controlled events versus these more scenic trail races is when you do have a bad patch, whether it be mentally or physically, it tends to spiral really, really quickly. So like you can easily find yourself in a situation where you hit a little bit of a rough patch, which is going to happen. And you over, you overemphasize how bad that is. And then it starts to unravel and you call it early. I've done that before too, where I probably could have stuck it out a little longer, salvaged the day and ran, maybe not my fastest time, but a very respectable time. Um, and then there's been times where I've just like said, all right, calm down. <laughs> <laughs> just let's get comfortable for maybe a mile or two, take whatever hit that presents and then just see what comes on the other end. Maybe things will turn on. Maybe it's just a low patch. And then two miles later, I'll be on the fast end of the range feeling infinitely better than I just did before that happens as well. So I think like, as I've done more of these and kind of learn kind of how those type of things present themselves, I've started to recognize spots that I should ignore and spots where I should take it a little more seriously. Um, So like earlier on in the race, I'm a little more inclined to think like, all right, this is probably mental, a little bit of a low patch. I should probably assess whether I'm hitting my fueling strategy, my hydration strategy properly and just get back on pace and see how that feels. Because just like the 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 thought process, if I'm at like, say, mile 30 that I've already overreached is pretty low in my mind because it's just relative to the task at hand. It's a pretty small input and it's just more likely to be, I'm just less likely to be off by that much uh, based on historical data and fitness and experience and things like that. And I'm more likely to probably say, all right, let's get back into that range and see what happens. And, you know, sometimes that works. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I still end up blowing up near the end of the race because it probably was too aggressive. Other times I end up kind of running strong at the end of the race because it was just a low patch. Um, So to some degree, I consider that kind of part of the game, part of the process. Mm -hmm. And the more of them you do, the more you kind of get yourself into a situation where like you've had experiences where you hit a low point where in the past you would have been like, oh, here's the spot where I start falling apart. And then you do to, oh, I now know that I've pushed through that specific spot in the race and that if I can do that mentally and physically, I'll come out the other end and potentially have one of my better performances. So you sort of raise the bar on yourself in terms of how many times you can kind of push through those points and find yourself on the other side. And it can become like a continual building process of like, where are your limits actually in terms of how that all plays out? Um, But yeah, I mean, and and then different events will present a little differently too. Like when I actually broke the world record at one point, I was at that spot. I had had, I actually was peaking for a different race that year. And just the uniqueness of this particular event drew me to it. 
but I was, I think it was like mile 40. I was in a situation where I had those doubts. I was like kind of falling to falling out the slow end of the, the pace range. And I thought to myself, well, this wasn't my A race originally. Maybe I should just kind of like accept a slower pace for the day, run a reasonably fast time, use it as a good uh, long training session for this next event. And then, you know, go there and, and nail that. But then I, before I made that decision, I just kind of like reflected on just the uniqueness of that particular event. And at the time it wasn't a guarantee that that one would ever happen again. So it's like, I may never find a situation quite like this. Uh, so I'm like, well, I need to give myself a little bit more of a chance here, <laughs> given those scenarios. So the fact that it wasn't something I was going to be able to replicate from an environment standpoint, again, in the future, kind of kept me more motivated to keep trying. So I just ran like kind of the splits through my head of what I needed to do from 40 to 50 and then 50 to 100K to kind of like stay where I wanted to be. And got back on kind of the, the positive focus standpoint and ended up hitting those 50 mile and 100K splits a little bit faster than I projected. So then I kind of spun that around. And then just like it can get negative really quickly, it can get positive too. So knowing that like, if you make a quick decision to change things and it ends up being the right call, you can get into a positive headspace really fast as well too. Cause you've got all this immediate feedback that you're doing it right. You know, it's like the uniqueness of being on a, a track that controlled is every split is very clear as to whether you're slowing or speeding up because nothing changed. And this particular event, it was actually climate control too, because it was indoors and that was the uniqueness of it. So I knew that there was nothing, not the weather, not the course, nothing was changing my pace other than me. So then like when I got back on and the effort started to normalize a little bit, you know, it was just such a positive kind of thing that kept spiraling in that direction for the remainder of that day for the most part. Um, you know, you have those like situations, whereas had I been at like a just more standard outdoor track and, you know, I was looking at it like, well, I could do another one of these in two months, three months, whatever it happens to be, you know, maybe that environment isn't as like as big of a draw in terms of being able to reproduce it and therefore you know, give me that needed advantage or needed incentive to kind of keep going when the when the stuff gets a little more difficult than you had planned in certain spots. Have you ever had any help from a mental performance coaching or mentoring or even from a psychological point of view to actually equip yourself with these techniques to be able to process and compartmentalize on the move whilst striving for high performance or is this all being learned through the process of ultra running and unpacking it yourself yeah yeah for the most part it's just kind of been through the own my own experience um you know i'm very curious in general so like I like to talk to other people who've done these things and get their perspective, follow other people, um, listen to their stuff. And then generally speaking, I think one thing that's been helpful too is like um, interviewing people on my podcast about this topic. So although I haven't like sat down specifically formally with like a sports psychologist and said, hey, let's unpack the ins and outs of this. Um, a lot of the stuff I think I probably could have learned faster, perhaps if I had done that. Uh, but most of it has been things where it's like, oh, I'm noticing these things that seem to work. And then I'll just ask them as questions to people who uh, have more of an expertise on that side uh, of stuff and just kind of see what their thoughts are about it. Because um, there's probably going to be some things where it's generalizable from just like a kind of sports psychology standpoint. And then there's going to be things that are maybe a little more unique to this type of discipline that you're going to kind of have to experience to really know and recognize. Um, so that's probably always been the balance. I suspect that's going to be something that gets a lot more common, though, as the sport grows. You'll probably see a lot more people kind of on the professional end saying, hey, where is the leverage point here I can have over my competition that's going to move me from finishing roughly around where my competitor is versus finishing like ahead of them. And I think that sort of stuff will probably continue to be uh, a, a lever that people do pull. I, I I would assume so as well. I mean, it's always been the pattern that's followed in other sports and ultra running is one that's so mentally disciplined mm -hmm. and control driven, whereby essentially all you're trying to do is manage the peaks and troughs of your emotions to be able to move forward with the strategy that you set ahead of time, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So uh, something I'm really curious about is I've, I've never run an ultra on a track. I've run long distances on a track before, and I've done many, many loops of tracks in my time. 
too many last year, in fact, but not nearly as many as you. So I'm complaining to the wrong person. Um, no, no, normally I can say that in good company and think, wow, yeah, that I've ran a lot, a lot of laps on the track, but no, the waste, wasted on you, Zach. <laughs> but the the real question I have is, is I get a huge amount from, what, what I love about ultra running is the exploration side mm-hmm. of it and the immersion in nature and different environments and the sort of state of mind you find yourself in when you're operating aerobically rather than anaerobically that, that comes with these events. So for you, how does the enjoyment and fulfillment vary when it comes to performance and metric driven ultra running on a track versus trail or more A to B style stuff? Cause mm-hmm. they're very, very different, but all, all the while being under the same umbrella and the same title. Yeah. Yeah. This is something where I think it's been a very important piece to the puzzle for me personally. And it's given me like so much respect for marathoners because a marathoner, if you're a professional marathoner, you're typically at a spot where like that is the race that is going to pay the bill, so to speak. And in order to do it well, you're really not changing a whole lot. Like you're you're, you're going to change some things for sure, but it's going to, at a macro level, it's going to feel like rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. And you spend years and years and years just kind of whittling down like seconds maybe uh, to kind of find that spot. And I mean, the mental fatigue of trying to stay excited about that after doing it for 10 plus years is is super impressive to me. Because for me, like what I like to do is like I definitely am an excite, more excited, more invested, more interested in runnable hundreds. It doesn't necessarily have to be 400 meter track, but I like the races where I can kind of get on the starting line and know the vast majority, if not all of this, I'm going to be running versus hiking. So that leads me to more runnable courses. Usually it leads me to the track and some of these types of courses. But I know from my experience, if I just keep doing those time and time again, I get to a point where like it does get a little bit of it loses a little bit of its like uh, its motivator um, where I'm not quite as excited to go and do, you know, that three to four hour long run on a track or go through the process of training in those same routes that are going to yield the best results from a mechanical standpoint for a controlled loop type course. And what I'll do is I'll just train for something completely different. Like I'll jump in a race like the San Diego hundred, or if my fortunes align, the Western States 100 and just take like a six month block where I'm like, all right, the, the goal of running hundred miles is still there. The goal of running and being consistent with my workouts is still there, but the environment is drastically different. Uh, the metrics I'm going to use to measure are going to change at a different rate because I'm working on something that's a little bit different than what I had been before. And it kind of reignites that excitement. And then I find when I do that, when I go back, uh, to say training for a flat, more runnable hundred after that it sort of kind of resets that excitement and I'm motivated again to the degree that I was at its peak to kind of go through that process with excitement and then ultimately also race with that level of motivation and excitement that's going to be necessary to kind of run my best race. So I have those options available and that's just like terrain based. You can also do distance based stuff too. So like um, other thing, other ways I'll stay motivated and excited with it is just like you know, target some shorter ultras for a while, you know, maybe 50 Ks to hundred K that sort of stuff. In fact, sometimes when I'm doing a flat runnable hundred miler, I'm actually doing this right now. I'm preparing for a, a flat runnable hundred miler, but I'm going to do like a handful of training races in route. And a few of them are just trail races. And my goal with those aren't necessarily to match the exact paces I'm going to hit on race day for the goal hundred mile, but it's just, I need to kind of renormalize the idea of being out there running, navigating aid stations, hydrating, fueling, all that stuff for longer hours than I'll likely do in training. So I can get a good seven, maybe eight hour session in uh, throughout the plan to just kind of keep that that mindset open and that sort of uh, part of the process closer to mind than the last time I ran long at a race. And I find that to be kind of nice too, because you always have like this shorter term target of like, oh, cool, I get this break kind of from the the routine of heading to the track on the weekend for a long run too. I'm going to go out on this trail and do a, you know, a long loop or, you know, something different. And that I find is helpful too, when you're kind of in the thick of it as well. Any bucket list races for you? Barkley marathons at some point <laughs> in your life, Leadville, Leadville for sure. What's, yeah. Leadville. I yeah. love the idea of Leadville because it has like, it has kind of, 
it has the bits and pieces of what I like about the variety of the sport kind of in one without a lot of the stuff that I tend to try to or the, the stuff I like less. So Leadville has some hurdles. Obviously, you're at elevation. You're at like minimum 10,000 feet. So like it behooves you to go out there for a couple of weeks ahead of time and acclimate or maybe do a training block out up in the in the high country just to kind of normalize that sensation. But and it's got a lot of climbing and descending and I, I like climbing and descending. I just tend to not be as excited about like super technical climbing and descending. Uh, Leadville is sort of that it's got a lot of climbing and descending, but it's a lot of kind of like runnable trail, um, you know, non-technical trail. So uh, that's definitely one that's on the bucket list. My wife's actually doing it this year. So I'll get a really good opportunity to crew and pace her and see the environment and really, you know, dip my toe in the water, as they say, and then decide when to try to get in myself. But that's a big one. Um, There's a race that I have done, but I unfortunately had food poisoning, so did not finish called the Spartathlon that I'd like to do. It's a 153 mile race out in Greece uh that one will that one's definitely on the getting to the finish line of that one i should say is on the bucket list um i'd really like to get back to western states at one point even though i've done it so it's not technically a bucket list but i do feel like i haven't executed that course properly and it's just such a i really like the way that course is set up just the way that it sort of like teases out the different types of runners being that like you start the first third is basically up in the high country a mountain trail then you go through this series of canyons which are unique in and of themselves and then the last third or so is like just kind of runnable slightly downhill for the most part trail so you sort of can't be so good at one of those disciplines that it comes at a big a big expense of the others uh and it kind of favors that person who is like good at all three of those or can at least know which one their strength is and which one of their weaknesses so they lean into the right sections of the course at the right time um and it just offers a ton of competition too so it's always fun fun one to get into because you just know you're going to be running with other people and and really kind of getting that extra incentive of if i slow down someone's going to pass me and if i speed up i'm probably going to pass somebody well if you uh ever want to come over and run the west highland way in scotland which is 96 miles yeah. i will happily drive the car because i will not be able to keep up right on I've... yeah no i need to get out to the uk <laughs> I... and do some racing it's a it's a core component of what I've got coming up at the end of March. So I've been wrecking it the past couple of weeks, and it is a stunning, beautiful setting that I'm very proud to be able to be nearby. Um, but the race every year is is very competitive and got some some very good results. So I would love for you to rock up and just decimate those with high hopes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. Like, I'm sure. Oh, I'm feeling feeling good about this 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 race. I'm from from this part of Scotland. I know the Trath well. That Zach better. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. That's. Uh, do you know the but, Centurion running folks out your way? Uh, no, not personally, okay. not personally, but there's, yeah, there's some, I mean, there's some brilliant, brilliant events out mm-hmm. here. Um, a lot of them are quite sadistic in the way they're put together. Um, yeah. I mean, there's the, my, my, I did the double brutal extreme triathlon in 2022, which is literally a lap format Ironman in, in an extreme setting. Have you heard of the X-Tri World yeah. Tour? Mm-hmm. It's, it, yeah, so it's that, that style of race. It's not actually part of that, that group, but yeah, so cold, cold swimming, very, very hilly bike and the run involves a mountain and then brutal events who unfortunately are are closing shop at the end of the year just due to uptake so they've been running for many many years but it just doesn't work commercially anymore um there is a real challenge with that in the uk actually is 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 the commerciality of events companies are are struggling a bit to put to put things on effectively for the costs required Mm with these balance of signups required yeah. um i don't know what the economics of it is or what the data is on demographics and things but um yeah it's sad to see there's some some long-standing iconic races disappearing yeah um, but given i've done the double brutal I've, I've, i'm glad i've boxed it off but i am kind of strangely sentimentally sad that at some point i couldn't make the silly decision if i wanted to do to do the triple <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is interesting i know it's uh it's always i mean i've been in the sport i guess long enough now where i have seen kind of like phases where you know races have to close up shop because of one reason or the other um here in the united states i feel like it's more been growing than anything just because of the popularity of the sport and then just non-traditional people to ultra running are starting to come into it now as like a challenge 
of some sorts. Um, a lot of hybrid athletes and, you know, like different communities that would maybe otherwise not necessarily find it have been finding it. So you still have the challenge, though, where um, I'll see like a race organization that has a bunch of races. And when you really dig into the details, it's like, oh, you've got let's say 10 races, but only really two of these make you any money. So it's like those two mm-hmm. events are holding the whole operation up. And then it's like, how do they nurture those other ones so that there's still options available for people outside of those two main ones, but don't like draw the whole ship down as they say, and, uh, make the whole organization kind of fail. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough one. I don't envy the RDs day to day. No, no, me neither, me neither. But I, I, I empathise with them out of the the challenge of navigating the the market and everything considered. Mm-hmm. Um, but on that, with the rise of popularity, I mean, it, it's still the popularity is increasing for sure. I mean, with our coaching business, the amount of people that come to us wanting to do their first ultra, mm-hmm. coming from a rugby playing yeah. background or a strength training background, is 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 on the up, hundred percent. And I, it, it, of course, it is all over the world in that space. But I personally believe, and you can agree or disagree with me on this one that if somebody is able-bodied to do so, there is value for everybody to extract from doing an ultramarathon at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Agree or disagree? I 100% agree, and I'll add to that. I think people tend to over-predict their lack of ability to do one. So I think people think in their mind, they're like, I can't run a few miles. How am I going to run 100 and the reality is you won't probably run 100. Like if you get out to most races that people are going to do, the winner probably won't run 100. So they'll probably do some hiking in there. So I think a lot of times like you envision like the worst part of it and then you project that onto the entirety of the experience when in reality you 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 it's not the, that the whole thing isn't like that. So um cutoffs are generally pretty generous i mean you can find some tough ones for sure but you know you can find races where the cutoffs are pretty generous to the degree where like if you're moving you know two or three miles per hour they'll let you stay out there so like you have a lot of flexibility in terms of like getting to that finish line if that's your goal and like you said like the experience of starting a long ultra marathon and getting to the finish line there's a lot of similarities in like the takeaways, the lessons, the things that you you actually use from that experience to better everything else that are just as true to the last person finishing as it is the first person finishing. Um, and I think it's just like the number of things I've mapped into my own things in life outside of running from the process of training and navigating races and things like that are essentially endless at this point in time. So I always think about like, you know, how do you get people that experience so they can start seeing that process and really kind of considering how do I use this sort of framework to, you know, better my business, better, you know, my organization on something else, or even just like getting yourself better prepared for a a different hobby or interest that you have down the road. I think there's a lot of, a lot of value adds there. If somebody's listening that thinks, wow, I'd love to do an ultra at some point, that sounds like there's so much value for me to extract but I wouldn't know where to begin mm-hmm. or I could never do that. What would you say to them? Yeah. Um, I would say like if someone's interested in kind of like getting into it, it's like, it's like most things knowledge is going to be power. So like diving into just like the community as a whole, there's a lot of like people who are willing to share their experiences, a lot of like groups and things like that. Um, coaching services and things like that that will help you navigate. I would say like, of the coaching clients I get, like a lot of them, they come to me for that very reason. They're like, they've gotten to the point where they're like, okay, I saw my buddy do this and I know if he can do it, I can do it. Or if she can do it, I can do it kind of a mentality. And then there's like, I just need to know what steps to take when. And I think that's where like having some programming is probably helpful for people so that they're not making mistakes that are very preventable, uh, especially early on. And then you can kind of look at it. I like to look at it too, is like, I've got, I'll get coaching clients sometimes where they very much want to work with me for a long period of time, even when they start knowing what I'm going to prescribe for them. For the most part, they like the accountability of having someone else kind of chatting about it along the way and giving them the schedule and holding them accountable. But then I've got people who are look at it as kind of like a course where it's like, Hey, I'm going to work with you for 
a training buildup or two, invest the money into that. And then after that, I'll have the scaffolding required to kind of just n- at least eliminate the low hanging fruit mistakes that I would make on my own. And I think those are those are usually good, uh, good starting points for people. Find some groups, too. Uh, there's a lot of running groups. And nowadays, with the rise in ultra running, there's usually some ultra runners in there that you can kind of chat with and get a get an idea of kind of what worked for them, what didn't work for them and stuff like that. Podcasts are huge. There's all sorts of good running related ultra marathon specific training and nutrition and hydration type podcasts out there that will be kind of helpful for kind of learning the lay of land and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think approaching it, I think the value of the hundred or ultra marathon too is like, there's things we know just from like reasonably accurate extrapolations from what we know about just physiology and human performance and things like that. But then there's just like the unknowns of things like, you know, there's different ways to do this and we just don't know which one necessarily is the best or is there really a best versus everyone's going to be a little different and it's your responsibility kind of to figure out which one is going to kind of play out best for you on, on race day or in training. And I think embracing that. So embrace the fact that there are going to be things that you can't predict and things that you can't control and navigating those is part of the excitement. So 100 100 milers and ultra marathons tend to be something where I think like getting yourself prepared and aware enough so that you have you're not sitting there just like throwing things up against the wall or like grasping at things in the dark is good. But going in thinking, all right, there's going to be a point where something happens that I wasn't able to necessarily build into the strategy and I need to be quick and able to like take that and adjust to it and learn and kind of just like make the best decision in that situation. And embracing that, I think, is important because if you think perfection is going to happen, then you're likely going to hit a spot where it's clear to you that that's not the case. And if you think that that's the end of your day, then you might have a frustrating experience versus knowing something you can't predict is going to happen. Wait for it. When it happens, recognize like, oh, I didn't plan for this. And then immediately go to, all right, where are the tools that I learned to navigate this situation and how do I use them? I find that to just be such a fun piece to the sport, that kind of relative unknown where it's not as clear as, oh, this person has you know this workout, they're going to be faster because of it. It's like maybe, or maybe that doesn't necessarily map to the end stages of an ultra marathon, and therefore someone else with a different strategy is gonna gonna finish fe- ahead of them, or, or in some cases, just the difference between not finishing and finishing in general. And the key detail is, is it should be scary. Yeah, exactly. It should be intimidating. Yeah. It should be it should be the unknown. It should scare you, mm-hmm. and that's kind of where the value lies. If you go into it thinking, you know what, I'm gonna smoke this fifty miler, then you should probably be running a hundred miler. Yeah. <laughs> Because yeah. the joy and the adventure is in mm. the not knowing, holy shit, yeah. what is going to happen when I hit mile 70? Yeah. 30 miles to go. That's over a marathon. That's so weird. Mm-hmm. How did I find myself here? Yeah. And I think that's where I've seen a lot of the value is, is answering questions I didn't... It, 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 actually, it's discovering questions I didn't know I would ask myself <laughs> and then finding the answers to them that I can then carry and apply to my life out with this present moment of thinking this was a terrible decision to run a long way yeah which I'm, I'm kind of speaking speaking to a future version of myself trying to gm up right now that's kind of the way i'm thinking yeah you know and it's one of those things where like if i if i look at like the fifth hardest race i ran there's not nearly as much val i'm not pulling as much value from that event for other areas of life like when i'm out having a hard run or a hard workout i'm not reflecting on the fifth hardest race i've ever had i'm reflecting on the hardest one i had and like when I'm in a, if I have like a really busy schedule, I'm looking at like, okay, I think I can make all this work, but it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of focus. I'm not thinking of, you know, the time I went out for a run and it was all enjoyable because there's no lessons in there that I can use to navigate a hard situation. I'm thinking of the one where I was like, I set a goal that was aggressive. Uh, I went for it and I achieved it because I just was able to navigate that environment in a way that didn't yield to more mistakes than than would be uh, be available to me and, and still meet the goal. And, you know, those are the ones that you're just always pulling from for these other things. So if you go into it thinking of it like that, where, you know, the more I persevere, the more I learn, the more I embrace this unknown challenge, the more you're likely going to walk away with tools that you can use for other things or, or even just, you know, your next race. What do you want the future to look like? 
goals wise? Um, it's a good question. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm definitely, I'm definitely probably near closer to the end than I am the beginning when it comes to my own running performance. Uh, so I sort of have tiers of goals that are relative to what like I enjoy about the sport. Um, and those are more robust in non, I shouldn't say non-performance, but like I just have more interests in the sport and the world of endurance and ultra marathon than I probably did 10 years ago. So I would still think I can run my fastest race, uh, for a hundred miles. Um, I still think my faster days are ahead of me. So I, I definitely want to like lean into that and see if I can improve my, my personal records at a variety of different events and distances. Um, are there any hard and fast numbers or is improvement? Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, are, you, are you keeping it vague? Uh, no, I mean, I'll put some numbers out there. I think breaking 11 hours for a hundred miles is within mm -hmm. my reach and it's definitely a goal that I have set out for myself. Um, there's, it's kind of, you kind of moving at the pace. Some people do Ironmans at yeah. that point, which is kind of, <laughs> kind of disgusting. It's uh, pretty wild given that there's actually no bike involved. Yeah. <laughs> no bike, no swimming or biking. Uh, that's probably good. The swimming side is probably good for me. That just none of that involved, but, <laughs> but yeah, so I think like, you know, there's a few components in there where it's like, just as sports grow and technology improves, there's things that are available now that weren't when I was, you know, first getting into sports. So like the shoe stuff with kind of runnable surfaces is the big one in running right now where we have efficiency improvements with footwear that map out to like what would be probably enough to move me from my current 100 mile PR under 11 hours. So, you know, there's that input. And then there's just the, you know, the, the ability to say, all right, I did 1119. I, I think I can take that experience and learn enough from it that I can get faster yet. I think there's those days are still ahead of me, or at least there's a runway of time for me to be able to still do that. So that's really something that's intriguing to me is to kind of do that. Um, like I said before, some of those bucket races, uh, or bucket list races that I'd like to still do or get back to are very much things that I'm thinking about. Um, if we're looking at the performance side of things, uh, there's a huge project I, I want to do at some point that I was supposed to do earlier in my career, but I had got an injury in preparation, unfortunately, which is a transcontinental run where you run from, uh, San Francisco to New York. It's like roughly 3000 miles, mm. um, in best case scenarios, probably six weeks uh of just basically running sleeping and running again with as much eating as you can squish into that time frame <laughs> um that's something i have on my uh kind of long-term list of things to do while while i'm still kind of interested in kind of the competitive side of of, of running you know outside of that i think it's like i think the sport's going to continue to grow and i think it's going to grow exponentially over the next decade so like continuing to build resources for other people so that they can like we were talking about before, have some structure in place that when they decide, hey, I'd like to do one of these things, where do I start? It's not difficult for them to find those sort of things. So whether that be like, you know, coaching, offering podcast episodes, social media content that kind of helps people navigate some of those things are things that I'm, I'm definitely thinking about now and hoping to kind of continue to um, dial in and uh, produce for, for people coming into the sport and, and learning it and trying it out for the first time. Fantastic. Well, Zach, thoroughly enjoyed that. And uh, I don't think my mind's any less blown at the paces that you move at, but I, I, I understand the mind, the, the man behind the paces a little bit better, which is uh, ultimately all I could have expected. So thank you very much for your insights and all the best for breaking sub 11 in the future. Where is the best place for people to find you online? Yeah, well, first, thanks for having me on. It's been a blast chatting with you. Best of wishes with your preparations and everything. Um, if people want to connect with me, like everything that I do is linked to my website, which is just zachbitter.com. Perfect. Simple. That'll be in the show notes down below. Zach, thank you very much and have a fantastic rest of the day. You too. Appreciate it.